All right, so welcome everybody. Uh, today we're gonna talk a little, a little bit about rain gardens. Um, so first of all, what's a rain garden? It's really just a way to, uh, it's honestly just a, 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 wet, a very seasonally wet garden. Um, you know, if you're, it's a, it's a garden that you've planted into a depression uh, that, with the purpose of capturing and reducing your stormwater runoff, uh, specifically from impervious, typically for, from impervious surfaces. So these are, uh, impervious surfaces are things that won't allow water to penetrate through. So that'd be your roof, uh, your sidewalks, driveways. If you have any compacted soils that you, uh, uh, that water runs across instead of soaking into it, those would be all the impervious surfaces. Um, the reason we, 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 th that we want to use, uh, we're encouraging people to start using some different, uh, some rain gardens. Um, it's increasing, reason, one of the reasons where benefits there is that it increases the amount of water that filters into the ground instead of off the property. Um, and this helps provide protection from flood, localized flooding. Um, so there's gonna be less water going into your roads, into your streams, into your drainage, to, uh, drainage streams. Um, that's gonna help, uh, and, and it's gonna go down to, to the groundwater instead of into the uh, cross surface. Um, another benefit is that it's all for helping to filter off any uh, pollution. So if you've got a driveway, across the driveway, if you've got any uh, cars that might have a small oil leak, if it's going, instead of going, running down into the driveway or off into the street and into the, going, uh, draining directly into the river, those oils or any, any fluids and dirt and dust um, and pollution there can then go into the ground, get captured there, and hopefully once they're there, they can be broken down, either captured or, and stay put or captured and broken down by local microbes. Um, so that's one of the ways we can improve that, that water quality there. Uh, it also helps, uh, not only is it helping filter off that, that runoff pollution, it's also gonna help with soil erosion. So if you have any soil, water moving quickly, uh, it might start dry, cavi um, digging through the soil, causing some channels um, and washing away. Um, helps to kind of recapture that soil onto your property instead of it losing that, that valuable topsoil. Uh, and finally, it's a, it's a great way to provide some different habitat for wildlife as well. So this is just what we're talking about as far as the stormwater runoff. Um, this is kind of excessive, you know, heavy rain event. Um, and all these drains that you see along in any of your cities and, and uh, municipalities, that's going, most of those are going directly to the river. So they don't go get processed. So any of the oils, dirt, and, and pollution that's on that road is going directly into your streams and rivers. Uh, I don't know how many people, where everybody's from. I know at least here in Frankfurt um, and all along the Kentucky River, there's a lot of people, a lot of municipalities, a lot of places that are, are pulling their, not only is our stormwater draining off directly into the river, but we're also pulling our drinking water from that same place as well. So it's important that we want to maintain, try to keep that water as clean as possible. Um, just so that way our, uh, you know, water treatment plants are doing the, have to do, don't have to work nearly as hard to try to make that water safe again. Um, some of the pollutants that we're looking at, um, it's, it could be everything from pet waste, uh, lawn chemical, fertilizer and lawn chemicals, uh, any kind of sedimentation. So if it's a, you know, whether it's dirt from a new construction site or, you know, a bare, bare soil on, on, on a property, you know, the sediment coming from there. Um, if anybody spills any detergents, paints, um, you know, washing your car in the driveway, um, that water is going directly, you know, a lot of times goes directly into the, to, on the drug road and then down into the streets and drains from there. Um, yard waste actually can, can cause quite a bit of, of, of pollution as well. So if their leaves and, and grass clippings get into the storm drains, they're going to kind of uh, release a lot of nutrients um, that are going to cause algae blooms into the, your, your waterways. Um, and as those algae blooms kind of they'll come up, and then when those the nutrients used up, all those all those algae blooms when they, they break down, they, they'll break down quickly and suck up the oxygen, soak up the oxygen as they break down, and and you'll, that's where you start getting those fish kills. Um, rain gardens. Uh, some people think of rain gardens might be you know like a bog or a wetland garden. Um, a little different than that. Bog gardens, bogs or wetland gardens typically stay wet uh, for long periods of time. Um, not necessarily staying in water, but the soil stays kind of saturated and so soaked for the whole time. Rain gardens ideally are only going to capture that water. They're going to hold it for a day or two, and then 
it's going to soak down into the soil, into the groundwater. Um, one of the reasons that we, I, this is the, the rain gardens are going to be better than, than just using your conventional lawn. They can actually allow, because they're capturing it and allowing it to soak in, they can soak up uh, about 30% more water than just in than just your normal lawn. Um, like I said before, there's a lot of, we can also use them for, for habitat, you know, many of this, the, this milkweeds and different flowering plants do well in those, these wet, these wet and transitional areas. So the re way they typically work, let me find that laser pointer again. So the way they work um, is they, their rain guards are typically dug down into a depression, um, into a low, lower point here. So that way, as water's hitting that roof uh, into the driveway, the, the, the downspout, and they can drink, flow directly in there or off the parking lots. You know, here we've got a, a grass buffer, uh, but it still can dry, drain directly into that. Um, let me move, there it is. Um, and as that rain is captured in, it, it, it accumulates, it captures into this, the rain garden, which kind of slowly filters down. Um, where's that next one? So that's where it's kind of storing it for a bit. Um, and then it, over the next couple of days after the rain event, that allows it kind of to drain out in, into the groundwater itself, straight down to the bottom. Let me turn that off, there it goes. Um, so as far as site selection, um, that could be a really critical portion of it. Um, when you put a rain garden in, you're, you're typically look, ideally you'd be looking for a full sun or part shade place. There are options um, for shade gardens. Just if you're looking for a lot of flowering plants, um, your full sun, your part sun, part shade uh, areas are gonna be the best suited ones. Um, there are some plant options for, for, for part shade, but they're just, you're, you're typically st uh, limited to a, a smaller number of, of plants in, in, the, in the shade. Um, you wanna make sure that when you're looking at this, you're gonna be uh, keeping 10 feet away from any houses or buildings. Um, you don't want this, it to be so close that when the water seeps down to the ground, it um, that now becomes groundwater that goes into the crawl space or basement. Um, similarly, you, you want to stay, stay away from any septic, septic uh, fields or wellheads. Again, you're collecting pollution, you, you're, you're collecting water, and the septic field is already trying to drain water away from that. You don't need to add, extra, if you put it over top of a septic field, that's adding extra stress. Wells, uh, you potentially are adding additional stress, uh, potential sources of pollution into the well that you might be drinking on. Um, that's off, you know, groundwater as a well, and you're collecting pollution essentially trying to collect and, and capture pollution, polluted water into those, those rain gardens. So you don't want that, that, that next to your wellheads. Um, trees and utilities, uh, that's more from the stack, fact that we're gonna be digging down. Um, tree, a lot of trees don't necessarily want their feet uh, wet for as, that long. So if you put it right next to a tree, you're not only gonna disturb the tree's roots, but also add the extra stress of, of being maybe more wet than it, it initially was growing up to be. Uh, and utility is more practical. You don't want to go through all this work just to have utility lines have to, if they have to go do a service, you don't want them tearing up through the, th through that. Um, and just to say with the utilities, you know, we are, when you do rain gardens, you typically are excavating into the ground. You do want to make sure that you have, call it um, 811, whatever the septic, have the septic get your utilities marked beforehand. You want to, when you're looking at it overall, you, you're looking about where, Typically, you're kind of trying to cite it where that water is not already naturally gathering, um, but not in a spot that it's always, you know, if it's already mucky and always wet, that's not necessarily a good spot. That's a spot that's not draining, that's not going to allow that water to drain out the bottom. So the steps I would normally take with this, it's not much, you know, we starting off, it's not much different than what I would recommend for uh, choosing a site for, for any other type of garden. You know, surveying, sketching out the property. You want to make sure that you know any buildings, pavement, trees, any other um, hard surfaces. Uh, and then a little different is downspout locations. Um, it's best if you can get to scale. One one trick that I've started using to try to get myself to scale is I will pull up um, one of the online maps, satellite maps. So either you know, like Apple Maps, Google Maps, or uh, MapQuest, something like that. They usually will have satellite image of it. You can zoom in on your house. Um, it may not be the best quality, uh, a little grainy and maybe a little too cluttered for it, but I'll, a lot of times we'll print off a, a, a picture of that 
my that property and then i can kind of trace around those hard pieces the, the actual things so that way i don't have to go out and try to measure and get everything exactly measured and placed the right spot i can just kind of trace over my main points that i need to from that main map that way i can get my proportions right um it's a little trick that i've had just to try to keep myself from having you know trying to measure and get the exact angles right now once you get that um the pavement kind of it, you get that initial sketch of the property um it's it's good to try to figure out where that water is going to be flowing um so sometimes you can just take a look you know getting down which way is the, the ground sloping um where the round you know where those um down spots are coming out you can kind of guess roughly where the ground, that water is going to flow um but sometimes it's really good just to, since this is a big endeavor a bigger endeavor than some other gardens uh it's good to kind of wait just till a, some sort of rain event and you know grab a raincoat and some boots go outside and just to observe where that water actually is flowing from the downspouts and off the pavement um that way you can see where the what part of the yard what part of the areas are going to actually the water is actually soaking in is there a spot that the ground it's it's maybe too too much too bit steep of the slope or too much water coming off of it and it just it actually is running across the top of the, the, the top of the soil surface instead um make note of those kind of things also look at where the uh where where does it leave the property too so you, that way you can try to mitigate and capture as much water on your property as possible so here we've got just essentially the same house, um, all spaced out. Uh, you ideal, you're looking again. Here's the downspouts uh, for on each four corners of the house. Um, when you're looking at it, you're kind of not necessarily looking at the whole roof itself, but you know just what's draining to that, going to be draining to that that uh, garden itself. So, for example, if you put a rain garden around here you're looking more, you know, this quarter of the house, this quarter of the roof is going to that drain, that, that downspout, it's be potentially going into the rain garden, you know, depending on the slope, is the driveway going in there as well. Um, when you're looking for, for sites, uh, you want to look for a relatively flat site. That's not always, I know around here in Franklin County, we're, that's, that's kind of a rarity to find a truly flat space. Um, but it really needs to be just something less than 12% than grade. Uh, and a little, little hard to figure out. Most people, I, I know I'm not necessarily, it took me a while to figure out the 12% grade and how, how to do with that. Um, but what we're talking there is over, uh, over a foot distance, that ground should only drop an inch and a half. So that's, that's a pretty steep grade if you're on a 12% grade. Um, but you're looking less than 12%. Um, that's kind of an extreme condition. You're probably looking more for you know, five to eight percent at that point. Um, and with the percentage grades, if you're if you're not sure how to do it, there are online calculators for it. Um, you can also remember that it's it's you know it, um, if you're if you're looking for it, it's the amount of drop of over a distance, and you want to make sure that you're using the same disc. What where most I see most people mess uh, messing up is that they want to do number of inches and divide it by the foot. And it's really, you know, it's one and a half inches over 12 inches per, per 12 inch span. That's really what we're talking about with that 12% grade. So if you have, you measure out a foot and, and that's 12 inches, you, met, you drop down how much the distance is uh, below that. And then, you know, you're dividing the drop of inches over the 12 inches or whatever inches of spread across it. So you just have to make sure, the biggest thing there is you're just using the same um, inch, same units for both, both both times. Um, and it's a little confusing. There are, I believe, I know there are several calculators. If you just search slope calculator on it, that can help as well if, you, if that's getting a little bit confusing. Um, another thing as far as the site selection goes, you want to make sure that we have uh, what we call internal drainage. Uh, you know, the, the surface drainage is a little easier for people to understand. That's where the water is going to kind of slope down and go roll down, flow downhill into the creeks and streams. Internal drainage is more of how that water moves within the soil column. Um, so before you, once you kind of figure out where you want to do, uh, have a garden site, this rain garden, it's good to do a percolation test first. So this is uh, a test to be able to determine how well that water, that internal water drains in, in the soil. Uh, so you dig a, a 12 inch hole, 12 inches deep, um, 
you fill it all the way up to the top, let that drain all the way out. And that might take a while depending on the soil and how wind last rain has been. Um, so you, you drain it out first. Uh, so drain, you fill it up the first time, let that drain all the way out. Um, and then once that's drained, you fill it up again. So once you saturate that soil uh, the first time, you drain it, fill it up again, and then you wanna see how fast that water drains out that second time. Um, if it drains in less than an hour, that's way too fast. Um, you probably, you're pretty much on sand. Um, you're looking for anywhere for that to drain within 20, within about 24 to 48 hours at the most. That's going to be around your kind of what you're looking for, for a good drainage. Uh, if it takes you more than 48, 48 to 72 hours, that's going to be too wet. Um, you could, you could always look for, inst instead of doing a bog garden, or instead of doing a wetland garden, you could always consider doing a bog, a bog or a wetland garden instead. And there's a lot of cool plants you can use there too. Um, when we're talking about the gardens, we really want to make sure that we're trying to get this. The idea is to try to get its size to be able to take the first inch of rain. So we call, when you're talking about that, looking at the material, the information, it's really kind of the, trying to capture the first flush of, of rain. And that's going to be where most of that pollution is going to come off on it. Um, so when you are sizing that, you need to look, that's going to be depend on the amount of impervious surfaces. That's the, the, the hard surfaces, your, your roof, your driveways, your walkways. Um, roughly get your measure uh, the, the foot, your, your overall area, sp space and surface area that you're going to be trying to capture from. Um, for houses, you don't want to do the actual surface area, uh, but the actual footprint of a house. So, um, and it doesn't have to be necessarily exact. Uh, if you know roughly, you know, a, a 2,000 square foot home, it's usually got a peak on it. So you're at least dealing with half of that. Any one side is dealing with that at the most half of that. So instead of 2,000 square foot home, you might have to deal with 1,000 foot on each side of, of, the, of the roof. And likely you might have more than one drown spout. So, you know, figure out how many, how many of those you have there. Um, and, and work that out. It doesn't have to be exact, but just getting a rough idea uh, about how much surf, how many square feet of area you're trying to capture from. Um, once you kind of figure that out, um, you're, you're, you got to try to figure out the figure out decide which how deep you want your your pine depth to be. If you're on a pretty flat site, um, three inches is is typically adequate for most residential gardens. Um, if you have a slope, you have the option of going a little deeper, or you might need to go a little deeper just to try to get. Uh, uh, what the, the space to be level as possible um, to get it in the right space. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that, like actually how we're, we're, we're installing that too. But, you know, that's going to give you, once you get the overall size of the garden and the depth, that's going to get allow you to figure out um, how much rain that's going to be allowed to come in. Uh, for just another example here, uh, for, for here we've got, you know, this is, uh, you know, with this whole roof side, this whole half half the roof is one side peaking peaking away from it. Um, likely from this drown spot here, you're only taking about the halfway point over, and that's just a good estimate. You know, roughly there. And so, once you get that square footage, you want to make sure that you're keeping that that you know that garden far enough away, at least ten feet, um, probably more closer than thirty feet, ideally. Um, that way, when the water comes out, it doesn't keep spreading out around the garden too. You kind of capture as much as possible going straight straight into that garden. Um, so that's, and you just want to make sure that you're not within those ten feet. Again, that's for the safety of your house to make sure that it, you're not you're not causing any prob any problems in the crawl space or down downspouts or in the crawl space or basements. Um, this is just an example. This is a, a table that's coming directly from the, the uh, publication that was sent, mail, that was emailed to you guys all before. Um, here is just kind of if you work out the, the rough surface area of your space of your house. Um, if you've got like, like I said before, a two thousand square foot home, taking one half of that roof, you you're on a thousand square foot. You're on a thousand square feet. You're looking for a garden at least hundred square foot, um, and then this is just some suggested potential uh, dimensions of that garden. They don't have to be that. They, they can be the, any dimension possible that you need for it. Um, easy, you know, 10, for, 10, by, uh, 10 by 10, 7 by 15. And it could be, you know, plus or minus a little bit too. Um, it's not, the sizing isn't exact, exact uh, science there that you have to actually have it 
at a specific size. Uh, when we're looking at the actual design, another thing to consider before you start digging in and, and figure out the placement and, and installing is, is to try to figure out what your actual, what design element that you're kind of looking for. Are you looking for a, a more naturalistic uh, prairie wetland stream bed kind of thing? Um, or are you looking more of a formal design garden? So whether it's, you know, a courtyard, here's, a, here's an example of a courtyard, um, more of a shady courtyard rain garden here's one coming off of uh, a road but it's still fairly fairly formal just by you know keeping those square straight lines in there and that's going to depend you know on your personal preference what your other landscaping around the, the garden is around the houses as far as the installation goes um before we get too far in that we probably should really start looking at the actual the actual different pieces of a rain garden um, when you're looking at it, you, you've got an area of, that we typically refer to as the inflow area. This is simply just the where the water is coming into the garden. So whether there's, you know, the, the downspout is going directly into it or the water is flowing off the driveway, across the, the, the yard into that space. The basin is the, the depression that we are making. So that's just the, the, the hole that you've dug out. That's the basin. Um, the berm on either side here, this is what's kind of capturing and keeping that water from just continue going on. Uh, it's similar to, it's really just a small earthen dam. Uh, and then the weir is going to be similar to, so uh, on, a, on like a commercial dam, this is going to be your spillway. So that if the water fills this up, you don't want it going up and over the berm. Um, that'll degrade and erode that berm. So this is kind of a controlled, controlled access point. So that way, if we get more than that, that rain garden can hold, um, if we get, you know, like we had a couple of weeks ago uh, with all that rain, likely this would have been filled up. You want to wait a safe place for this water, all the water to go. So this is just a slightly lower depression area that the water will kind of leave out from. Um, and that outflow area is going to be where just below that weir. So that's, it's going to go over, any excess water is going to go over the weir into the outflow area. Typically it's protected. So here we've got rock. That's just to keep the, the soil from, uh, falling out. So when you are digging the actual garden, uh, once you kind of get this, the, the shape going, um, similar, once the shape you, when you get the shape on it, it's gonna be similar to any other garden design um, using, you know, you, you can shape it, get the general shape on it um, with, with old, ho with garden hoses, you know, flagging tape, um, you can use paint, mar the, the, the marking paint. Um, once, once you get that kind of roughed out, then you can start doing the, the actual installation. Um, here we've got um, this dotted line is just representing what the original grade was um, before that starting digging. So this is our original grade. This is where we knit, we started at. Um, the first step there is you want to use a, a tarp. You want to actually remove the top three inches of topsoil and set that to the side. Um, you want to be able, that's just because that's that's where your your best soil is and you don't want to lose that somewhere else. Um, after you lose that, you remove that top three, you want to actually then dig down into about six, the, the next six inches. That's going to typically be your, your subsoil. That's where you're, you'll find heavier and harder clays. Um, when you start, once we get that done, getting that done, you can actually use some of that subsoil to start building the berm. That's what you're going to use to kind of build that backside of it um, and, and raise that above the, 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 the grade level. Um, here's that blue line. It's just kind of that level line. This is where we're going to try to start capturing. As the water comes down, it's going to capture into this, this basin and, and get stopped by this berm. But once you get it down to that, that nine inches down, um, that's where you will then want to put back that topsoil. Um, you, if you don't have enough topsoil for it or you don't think the topsoil is of great quality, you can mix that topsoil back in with some compost as well, just to try to uh, in encourage a lot of good plant growth there. Um, when you are, if you're not putting that, that original soil back in, you want to also kind of make sure that since this is heavy clay content, the subsoil typically, you want to make sure that the, uh, especially the bottom is not a very a completely smooth surface. Um, otherwise you're creating kind of almost an inverted pot that's going to hold the water. It's going to start uh, create, cause that. So just going through, uh, you can, if it's big enough, you can use a rototiller to kind of break up, lightly break up that soil surface, 
if not hard rake or just kind of using a spade, kind of as a you know roughly chop um, a couple different you know couple different directions across it. That's just allow it roughs up that cert that soil this this soil surface down here and allow it to not uh, be a smooth you know clay bottom. Um, we're not trying to create a pond here. Uh, so you put that soil back in. Don't forget, you want to also add again top, uh, two or three inches of, of mulch onto that, and this is where we'd be planting into it. Um, when we measure the ponding depth, this is actually from the you know where the, the top of the weir, where the weir is going to be letting out the water across there, um, and down to to the top layer of the mulch. So once that all this water, we're re really looking to see um, how much water it can capture once you know this is actually saturated. Uh, initially saturated. So that's where we're kind of measuring that ponding depth too. And the weir is going to be over, so the water will be coming in, ponded up here at to our level. Um, the weir would be on this side and it would just kind of flow back out once if it, if it, if it overflowed. Um, just from a different angle, just so we try to make sure that we under, try to help everybody understand. Um, you want to make sure that this berm is as high or, or slightly higher than where your inflow area is back over here, because this is where you want to make sure that the water is not flowing over and flushing that soil off. Um, you want to make sure that you're compacting and packing that, that, that berm down tightly into it. Um, you can you know, either buy or rent uh, tampers, either hand tampers, soil tampers. Um, you can even make one out of a, a, some scrap wood if you need. Um, you know, a two by two section of plywood attached to a two by four. Um, that's gonna, on the end of it, that's gonna create a, a good spot that you can kind of just at least start tamping down. Um, I've even, you know, in a pinch, you can start walking and kind of packing it down with your feet. But as you kind of are packing and layer, putting the soil on this, on the soil, subsoil into these berms, you know, packing it in on layers will make it a much more tighter, uh, tighter spot that's gonna be less likely to go across. Um, for long term of the, 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 of the long term health of that berm, you want to make sure that you're either going back and using rock and putting rock across the whole berm to protect it from erosion or grasses or a mixture of the two to try to help you know get the roots to, to kind of secure that berm in place long term or rocks and berms to kind of help do that. Um, you can see here the, the, the weir is going to be a little bit lower than the berm, um, at least a couple of inches. This is going to be this again, this is what's going to dictate your actual height of ponding. Um, and then here you can see the rock going down. Um, depending on how, how narrow you make the, the weir, this one's nice and wide, so it has space to kind of break that water off and allow that water to kind of flow in multiple directions without being too fast. If you make the weir, if you can only make the weir a little narrower, um, you might want to bring this rock, in, this rock, rock, protection, rock protection out a little farther into the flat area. Um, just so that way it has a chance to, that water has a chance to lose some speed and not dig a channel out underneath it. Um, again, it is critical that weir is going to be your, uh, your, your, uh, your kind of sets your thing. You want to make sure that that is just below the inflow level. So as you take a level line across it, um, that should just be slightly, slightly less than it. Uh, we covered that. Um, Sometimes there's uh, sections, if you've got buried downspouts, you can redirect, instead of having them going all the way, having the downspouts go all the way to the road, um, you can actually cut those off or, you know, if they pop up in the ground, up in the soil, um, those downspouts coming in, you want to make sure that if the downspouts are, going, are ending directly into the, the, the rain garden, you want to make sure that you are protecting that soil uh, in that area around there. So again, you don't want to check any kind of channeling the water moving too quickly. We're, we're trying to slow that water down and give a chance for it to get into the soil itself. So if it's moving too quickly here, it's going to blast, not only is it going to blast the soil out, it's also going to blast uh, soil around the roots. And those, even though these plants might be able to tolerate or like having their feet wet, they're not going to be able to stand um, regularly being blasted with a strong, strong water hose. So putting some rock around it just trying to get it to slow down um, as it comes into the garden, to that rain garden. Um, for example, this is an example I, I, I've, I've got from one of our specialists. Um, it looks good, except for we've got, again, this, this, this downspout going directly into it. Um, this grass here is going to take the full brunt of that force. So all this mulch and everything is just going to kind of get blasted away over time. 
putting a couple, you know, putting a couple rocks around there would, would help quite a bit, um, or even terminating this into one of the pop-up drains so that that way it's coming level at it. And then the water, as the water comes down, it, the pop-up drains have a, a 90 degree elbow on it. So as the water comes straight down, it has to stop, stop and slow down and turn the corner to come up and bubble out over it. Um, that would help slow it down some and then some rock around that would, would have been a good option right around here. Um, when you're talking about, now that you got the, the garden planted, this is where we want to start, we can start thinking about, uh, well, that, now we got it installed, constructed, this is where we can start thinking about our planting zones. Um, what, there's different terminology for it, but typically it's, it's, I just usually refer to it as the lower middle, lo, uh, lower middle and upper sections. Um, and this is just the lower area is going to be wet. The, me, the middle areas are going to stay, you know, it's going to get occasionally soaked, but not going to, going to dry out a little bit more. Upper areas are going to get the water, but never, typically never going to be fully submerged. Um, with plant, with uh, planting designs, it's uh, similar to any other uh, ornamental designs. You want to typically plant them in odd numbers. Um, it's a little bit more pleasing to the eye. It looks a little less contrived. Um, you know, threes, fives, sevens. Um, that's typically how we plant them across in it. Um, if you have a special plant, you know, there you can have a kind of focal point and use, use a single plant as a focal point if it's a big showy one. Um, as you're planted in, you also want to make sure that you would label them because if we go dormant, you may not be able to test, like, tell what the plants are or, you know, next spring, the next year as they're coming up, which ones are weeds, which, one, which ones are, new, are, are supposed to be there. And again, like most beds, you should definitely mulch it. But not only is that going to help um, suppress the weeds through the garden, so we don't have to be out there as often, um, but these are these are seasonally wet, seasonally dry weathers at uh, gardens. So they the plants are adapted to, to dealing with the water, but they are they're really adapted to being able also to deal with that wet dry cycle um, to help take some of that stress off. Especially as we're getting it established, you want to mulch it. That's going to help conserve not only help stabilize the soil underneath it, but also conserve the soil moisture over time uh, during those periods and kind of moderate this big swings. Um, you can pretty much use anything for the, the mulch, uh, anything from, you know, if you use gravel or rock for it, or even wood chips, uh, arborist trimmings, pine nut bark nuggets, anything along those lines. Um, specifically for, for a garden long term, I would recommend using something like a, a, a wood-based product so either arborist trimmings, wood bark, uh, ground, ground hardwood mulch. Um, the, 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 the or inorganic ones that the rock and everything work great. They don't break down over time, but as soil, you know, leaves, leaves dirt and what everything else washes in, that's when it slowly get buried in. And it's, it's a lot of work to try to dig up that gravel, wash it and put it back up on top again. Um, something like a wood mulch, you know, as it breaks down, you have to replace it, but it is breaking down and feeding the soil over time, adding that organic matter, adding nutrients to this to those that garden bed. Um, so that's where I usually would I usually stick with the, that. Um, you can use things like grass clippings, leaf mold, uh, straw into it. Um, they're lighter weight, so they're going to wash around a little bit easier. Um, but and also in a perennial garden, it's not necessarily the greatest thing just because it's going to break down quicker. So you're going to have to every year you're going to be having to apply a lot of material to it instead of applying the mulch and just kind of refreshing it and maintaining that two to three inches. Uh, this is just an example, another kind of a view from it, uh, uh, just so we can kind of see um, the different zones that you might be planting at. Uh, here at the bottom, you know, this would be the lower, the lower zone, this is gonna be your wet, wet zones, um, the middle medium zone just around that. Uh, and then your upper, upper zone is gonna be these ones that are kind of on the outskirts of the very plants. So these are going to be the ones that are going to be um, marginally tolerant along the edges. Uh, again, here, like I said before, here's a downspout. They've got some rock rolling along here where the water's coming in to kind of slow it down, keep that water from washing away. Same on this one. This is kind of a more of a commercial designed one coming off that driveway of this parking lot. It's going to slow that down going in. And again, they put they've got their overflow drain as a uh, as a commercial you know stormwater drain. And here is just a rock, not only to slow it down, um, but also to kind of act as a filter, to keep the mulch from going down that drain. Some of the plants uh, to use, um, it's a large variety of it, uh, different options to use. 
Um, for shrubs in that lower wet area, uh, things like the, the button bush is a lovely native that will attract a lot of pollinators. Um, nine bark, um, spice bush, uh, summer sweet. There's a, a in that publication that um, HENV 205, the res UK's residential rain garden um, publication, there's a, a long list, a decent list of, of different plants in that, that garden as well. Um, and it will tell you uh, the typical, you know, on shrubs, it'll tell you the, the height and the spread of how big that shrub is itself. Um, and also, you know, full sun, part shade. Most of them are gonna take that and do, be do best in full sun, but can take some part shade. Um, a lot of your, your especially on your, your shrubs and your, your flowers, the ones that can do full sun and part shade, they'll survive in part shade, but they're gonna typically flower less um, and not grow, obviously not grow as much just because they're not growing, uh, getting as much sunlight. So it's kind of that trade-off. If you've got that space, you'll get some flowers um, and the plant will grow a little sl slower, but they'll still, still survive and thrive in that, those spaces. Um, herbaceous ones, these are the plants that don't produce woody stems. Um, a great number here, it's since there's a lot of common plants that we might use in a, in a garden typically that can go in here, especially into that dry and moderate area. Um, the lower zone, um, blue flag iris, um, goldenrod, it can be a little aggressive, but there are some improved varieties that if, you, if you're not uh, trying to stick to strictly the native, native species, there are some, some uh, native plants that might, that would, native cultivar or cultivars of these that would help, you know, be a smaller or less aggressive of plants. Bee balm can be as well. Um, bee balm, I know, that I think they have bee balm listed, yeah, as a part shade. I would recommend against bee balm going there. Some of them, some of the plants that you are, from, if you've ever grown them, had other gardens, you see always have downy, a powdery mildew on it, so the bee balm and phlox. Uh, one of the th big things you can do to try to help limit that is not only get into a little bit wider space, but making sure that it's in full sun. That way, it, that the, full, the plant foliage dries out as quickly as possible, and you'll have less less uh, pressure from that powdery mildew. Um, things like swamp milkweed, swamp rose mallow. These are some of these uh, cardinal flower, uh, fox edge. Some of these plants are just going to be aren't going to deal well with, uh, as as well in some of our normal garden spaces. And this is an opportunity to kind of reach out and to reach out to some of these plants that, that want that wetter, moister soils that we typically can't provide without a lot of irrigation. Um, in the middle zone, um, there are tons of options for the, this area. Um, American Beauty Berry, Summer Sweet, Sweet Spire, uh, Choke Berry. These are all great ones that'll, that'll attract a lot of birds. Oh, Ink Berry as well, Ink Berry, Viburnum. Um, these are all lovely shrubs. Um, I believe most of them are native. Don't hold me to that. I can't. Um, but they also not only do they flower, uh, have a, have lovely flowers, but they will also produce uh, fruit that will attract um, songbirds as well. So if you if you're looking to try to get some more songbirds, some of these are are good 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 uh, shrubs to put into these kind of garden areas. Um, herbaceous plants again. Um, things like your 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 white turtle head, um, St. John wort really like to have that wetter that moisture soil, um, and these are op opportunity to kind of get the, get into some of those as well. Um, Miss flower, uh, there is it can be a, I can see I've seen it be a little aggressive at times, um, and that may just be um, some of it is just being that there hasn't been enough uh, competition or it's just been a really nice site. Um, keeping that one of the other ways you can kind of keep keep those some of these plants in check is if you if you know you've, you've got a plant that's a, a potentially a, a aggressive plant aggressive spreader is once it's done flowering cut those seed heads off um, you know you can keep them and, and grow them you know keep some back just in case that it doesn't reproduce to, or just putting some of the seed back underneath the plant that'll help kind of control where that plant is receding at uh, instead of letting it just grow every which direction. Um, in the upper zones, um, again, large option here, um, just because this is, starts getting into more of your normal common um, garden plants. Typically it's some of your common garden plants, but that will take some intermittent flooding, especially in the spring. Um, so American cranberry, that's a viburnum. Um, 
you know, witch hazels, blue star and, uh, and sonias are, are amazing. Um, not only do they give you the nice blue flowers, but in the spring, in the fall, they turn into a brilliant bright yellow, yellow foliage. Um, buckeye, some of the buckeyes and black eyed Susans, um, some of your ray flowers like this are, will help, again, not only attract some of your, your fruit eating uh, songbirds, but this will uh, attract some of your finches and every, everything as well to try to come maybe along those seed heads. Um, I know, uh, I think, I believe the publication kind of mentions avoiding shaded areas. Um, I don't necessarily, would, I wouldn't necessarily agree with that. It's definitely, it's one of those consider those trade-offs that you might have. Um, you know, if you have only an option to do in a full, fully shaded area, you can definitely do that. And it's just that the plant options are going to be a little, little bit more restrictive. Um, so you're typically looking at sedges, sedges and ferns, um, sweet flag that can, a little bit more grassy, ferny kind of things. Uh, Virginia bluebells will, will, would be a good option there, but they're a bit more of a spring, spring ephemeral, so they're going to be of a nice spring show. Uh, and then bottle bush buckeye, um, again, it's going to, it, it can, it can survive in those, those shaded areas as well. Uh, it's not going to have as, you know, magnificent blooming uh, uh, flower display as, as what's shown here, where it's grown in full sun, but you'll still get some flowers kind of display that will help pop in especially in the shade in that in those spaces. Um, when you're planting those, um, I really recommend incorporating some of the sedges, rushes, and grasses. Not only do they have a lot of fine, uh, fine roots uh, that will go out and soil and help stabilize it, um, they're also gonna help provide, especially if you have some of these more aggressive ones, they're gonna provide a lot of root competition to kind of slow everything down, kind of slow and keep every, all the plants back in check. Once they get into that, that mature height, mature sizes, they're gonna help um, keep plants in check as well. Um, and act, they'll also, also act as kind of a black backdrop. So that way your, your, your lovely, your, your beautiful flowering plants aren't just being a backdrop by a bunch of mulch. They'll have you know, more of a natural uh, full backdrop at that point. Um, if you can, um, I would recommend using, utilizing some local stones in there, um, any kind of any you know, ornamental path, fences, pathways, um, that's going to give you kind of to just try to tie some of your 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 native your native plantings um, tie this this rain garden into your your general garden decor and garden scheme as it is. That way, it's not just sticking out like a sore thumb. Um, it'll look more intentional and uh, more aesthetic if you can kind of have you know add some stones both into the rain garden and into to some of your your raised bed your your normal landscape beds as well. Um, so whatever theme you've got there, just kind of make sure you're carrying that theme in some one or two things into those those spaces too. Just try to give that piece of uh, appearance between it. Again, uh, can't say enough. Mulching is is one of the best things you can do in a garden bed or around a tree. Um, always keep that maintain that two inch layer of mulch is, is going to be a key, key key to most gardens. Um, this is just an example of kind of a more mature uh, rain garden. This one looks like it's kind of at a park or um, or golf course, uh, but you can see a lot of uh, grass is kind of providing that that backdrop for this color, uh, um, making it night looking nice and full, so it can kind of keep that color and interest um, throughout the year. Um, and then this is just an example where, where they uh, apply some larger stones throughout it, um, just to try to. They've kind of almost designed it as if it's going to be. A stream bed going from the forest almost at that point. Um, definitely is an option, not required, but just kind of adding those rocks in there just kind of add, so the large rocks kind of had, add some in, visual hardscape interest to it. As far as maintenance, um, weeding, just like most gardens, weeding is going to be crucial the first few years until those plants get established and kind of fill in and self shading the garden out. Um, you want to make sure, because we're trying to capture one of the main points of the rain garden is to capture water and, and try to help eliminate some of the pollution going in the waterways. We we'll make sure that we aren't using any herbicides in that area too. That's going to add to that that um, that pollution load as well. Um, so when you you're any of your gardens, any of the, the weeds, um, you want to make sure that you are trying to dig them out by the roots as much as possible. Um, and if if you can't, if it gets start getting a little out of the way, that's perfectly fine. The biggest things on some of these plants is just making sure that you you don't let them go to seed. So if if you know later in the summer 
it gets away from you, you got everything's going out, at least keeping the, the cutting off the, the, the weed seed heads, that's going to save you a lot the next year. That way it's, it's kind of keeping more of the status quo on the weed level than um, adding to it every single time that it goes to flower and seed. Um, if you've got some different plants that you're not necessarily familiar with, um, it would be good to look up what those seedlings look like. So that way, as you're waiting, especially in the spring, you aren't pulling the, your desired plants as you go. So you want to make sure, you know, not only keeping a list of it, but also ideally trying to map, give an idea of roughly mapped out where that is. Where do you expect it to be um, at that point? Um, within three or four years, you should have a good mature, uh, more mature uh, filled in garden bed. Um, most of your desirable plants will have filled in. It'll help start self shading out some of the, the garden and, and provide a lot of competition to keep the weeds out. Um, at the end of the season, I recommend leaving the stem, stems and seed heads of any of your non-aggressive, overly aggressive plants. Um, not only is this providing shelter for your beneficial insects, but also provides food for the songbirds. Um, in the early spring, um, you know, February, March, uh, if you can cut that back, instead of cutting that down almost to the ground, um, cutting that up a little higher, 8, 10, 12 inches, that'll actually provide nesting sites for a lot of the native bees. Uh, we've got several several thousand native bees. Um, a lot of them, not just the, the the mason, you know, the blue mason bee, but a lot of other species will nest in everything from a sixteenth of an inch up to, uh, you know, I think it's a quarter or three eighths of an inch um, cavities. They'll they'll use those those hollow stems from from last year as places to to nest and and rear the young. So you can start helping build up that native bee population. And some of these native bees um, are actually some, some of the better, best pollinators we have and do a lot of the pollinator service that, that, that we, we need around the gardens. Um, much more, a lot of them are much more uh, efficient at actually pollinating and setting fruit seeds than, than even the, the native, the, than the uh, European honeybee. Um, again, for the first year, um, you wanna make sure that you water, especially in, for the first year or two, um, in the dry periods, just to try, the biggest thing there is just trying to get those plants established, get those roots down deep into the, to the, the soil profile so they can find their water on their own. Um, you can hand water as much as you want. Um, if you're doing it this route, hand watering, you want to make sure that you are doing it in either early spring or, or early morning or, or in the uh, late evening. Um, that way you're not losing as much water to the evaporation. Um, Early morning is better than, than evening if you can. Um, I know ske work schedules don't always allow it, so that's, um, but if you do it in the, in the morning, you're kind of knocking dew off and not encouraging any other foliar plant diseases. Uh, if you're on a shorter period of time, you could always grab some soap proposers or drip tape uh, and wind that back up through. Uh, an easy way there, especially if you're forgetful like I am, is making sure, is getting a hose timer, whether it's a digital one that comes on at a set schedule, um, especially in a dry period, or they even make ones that are, are simply a kind of an egg, egg timer so, so style and where you, you, know, you wind it up for an hour or two, you can turn on and even if you forget to come back, it's at least that timer's turned off the water and it hasn't just been running all night long. Um, you know, I've, I've done that once or twice myself where I've forgotten the water, forgot to turn off water off of, on, a, on silver hoses. So I've just to, to, to deal with my, poor memory top skills and getting everywhere, I, I usually start using, I started using those. Um, as you're maintaining that, you do want to kind of, you know, you want to make sure that you are removing uh, a lot of the other bulk. Um, in a normal perennial garden, you know, it wouldn't be necessarily the worst thing to leave that material uh, kind of mulch, self mulch that, that plant with its own, own leaf, old last year's leaf and, and stems. Um, we don't want to, to have too much of that in there just because as that soil and debris will, will accumulate, you're, you're going to lower that ponding depth. And so you don't want to have to, you know, have to stop and dig this back out, trench it back down, and almost start over just to get that ponding depth down. down. Um, so limit that soil and debris just so that way you're not building it up again. Um, and ideally, you want to make sure that you're limiting compaction to this, any compaction. So you don't want to be walking through. If there's an area that you're going to be want, wanting to walk through all the time, um, when it's not raining, you can always put some garden paths and stones through it. You don't want a lot of compaction because that's going to lower your the amount of internal drainage that you have. It's going to make the internal drainage much worse, and the water that's in that's been captured is going to drain a little slower. Um, so, just some examples of different 
different, the, the wide variety of different gardens. Um, here's one where, you know, daylilies work well. They actually will take quite a bit of, of moisture. Um, so here, you know, you can kind of make it almost a daylily centric uh, uh, rain garden. Um, you know, sh more of a shrub heavy one. This one's a you know partial partial shade uh, as well. Um, and you can see, you know, some of these plants are going to be blooming at different times. So that's a, j just that's going to be kind of your standard thing with a lot of your other uh, perennial gardens. Is trying to design adding plants that are going to flower at different times of the year, so you have multiple interests throughout the year. Again. Here's more of a prairie style version uh, with got the latrice, the, 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 gray, the gray feather, the gay feather, um, black eyed Susan blooming in the middle of summer. Um, looks like there's even got some, some iris growing up on the edges here. Um, you know, it, it comes down to some of it just really what your overall preference is for the plant, for, for the garden, and what your plant, what, what your uh, design choices are. Uh, and here's just another example of, of a shade garden. Um, this one's pretty heavily shaded. They've got ferns, they've got some, some dahlias in there. Um, here's, it looks like um, foam flower, Tiarella, um, along the edges here, just trying to provide some different interests on those as well. So there's some options as far as shady. Here's a sunny border garden. Um, so, so really there are a lot of different options you can plant in there and make it look not even like it's supposed to be, necessarily have to be a rain garden. Um, for example, like this one here, this tiny border one, this one looks like it's pretty much grown into a ditch, an already drainage ditch already, established drainage ditch. So trying to, to incorporate that where that water is already accumulating and draining out itself just to try to help, you know, in, improve the aesthetics of the area. Um, with that, I'm, that's about the end of the presentation. Um, does anybody have any questions?